We welcome you to the ANU ILS Career Series Unraveling International Law. We acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, traditional custodians of the lands on which this interview was recorded. We pay our respects to elders past and present, as well as any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander viewers. We hope you enjoy episode two. My name is Angelique Nellis and I'm the Careers Director of the ANU International Law Society. Today we are very fortunate to have an incredibly special guest join us for the second episode of our video series. He is someone who has captivated eager law students and whose accolades have been meticulously analysed and praised around law school corridors and lecture theatres. On behalf of the ANU International Law Society, it is an honour to present one of Australia's best known and most renowned legal thinkers, the Honourable Michael Kirby, AC CMG. Mr. Kirby, we're so grateful to have you on our video series. Thank you for taking some time out of your very busy schedule to have us join you in your chambers. It's a pleasure and an honour. Given what you know about a career in international law, what advice would you give your younger self and furthermore law students who are wanting to pursue such a path? The most important advice is really to live life to the full and uh, that would involve doing a balance in life uh, somewhat different from the balance that I have struck in my life. Uh, A-type personalities, which includes an awful lot of lawyers, uh, do tend to spend a lot of their time at work, uh, but there are other things to do. Um, as my partner Johan keeps telling me, there are concerts to go to, plays to watch, books to read and um, generally find a life. But um, most lawyers, uh, especially those who are interested in international law, are going to be asking what can I do to improve the state of the nations of the world, the world itself, uh, the United Nations uh, and uh, the multilateral arrangements that have been established to uh, build a better world. And that is a puzzle, uh, but it's one that many Australian students have tackled, uh, and um, I hope we get a chance to talk about that, because I'm planning an article, which I'll probably publish in, publish in the Federal Law Review, on how to get a job in the United Nations because I think that would become the most popular <laughs> article I have ever written and I've been planning it in my mind for years and this interview may be the catalyst. So in regards to that, how can we incorporate ethical and moral values in our work? Well, I have tried to <coughs> give a hint on how that can be done in a number of decisions that I wrote during my time as a Justice of the High Court of Australia, uh, the most notable of which may well be Al-Kateb against Godwin, which is in 219 Commonwealth Law Reports. That relates to the relationship between our Australian constitution which is, I think, the sixth oldest constitution still in operation in the world, uh, and the new international legal order uh, established by the uh, Charter of the United Nations. So establishing that relationship on a better, uh, firmer ground than we have at the moment is a major uh, challenge for us in uh, our work as lawyers and international lawyers. What were some of your passions as a law student, noting you were an avid debater and thrived within student politics? Well, my, my passions were to some extent suppressed and repressed because um, when I was growing up I discovered that I was gay and it was very difficult in those days to uh, express those passions and fundamentally I joined student politics and I became the king of student politics. Uh, and uh, so I had one committee after another and that made me learn the lesson uh, of how to be a good chair 
which is a very important lesson that you learn if you're chairing student um, committees, which can often be extremely difficult. Um, and it also uh, taught me uh, how to think issues through and be respectful of others and that actually I think was very helpful to me later on when I became a judge and I think I was a very good presiding judge and uh, that uh, is something I really learned as a student politician but um, from that I learned uh, the need to be a joiner and so when I finished my law course I was always a participant in things. I, I became the student solicitor at the university and that took me to the uh, SRC meetings. <clears throat> From there I became the fellow of the Senate elected by the undergraduates and that brought me into rub shoulders with the establishment uh, at Sydney University. Uh, and then when that finished, I became a member of the Council for Civil Liberties. And uh, that took me into contact through pro bono work with uh, disadvantaged people. And um, I think these are very good experiences. Yeah. And it's important for you to give, I mean, self-evidently, and self-definitionally really, uh, lawyers and people who are studying international law are going to be top students and stop top um, individuals and they've got to be focused on something other than number one themselves and I found interestingly enough that when I was focused on student politics and on uh, my work in the, C the CCL, the C uh, Council for Civil Liberties, I found my grades went up because I was then more happy in myself. Mm. And uh, that was an important lesson I, I got uh, when I was the age of most of those who are doing the studies in international law. I think you raised an important part in regards to having to suppress and resuppress a lot of your passions. You have definitely inspired a lot of people not only by overcoming prejudices but paving the, paving the way for young people battling against the stereotypes. In a speech you noted that days of exclusion are numbered. Given your own experiences, um, what tips would you have for students advocating for further progression in inclusion? Well, frankly, I don't think students today need advice from me on these issues. Diversity is the issue of the generation, and it's increasingly so, and at least in Australia, we are increasingly appreciative of the fact that we've got to do better than we have done in the past. Uh, but if I contrast the time when I was a young law student with mm. the time today, uh, we were really horrible to the indigenous people and we didn't respect their rights. Uh, we were discriminatory against women uh, and uh, women were greatly disadvantaged in the law. Uh, we had the white Australia policy and we had uh, discrimination against people who were Chinese or African and uh, we didn't allow them to come and if they were married we didn't allow them to come to Australia. Uh, and with LGBT people, we had uh, criminal laws against them. Uh, and many other groups were similarly disadvantaged. Um, now, uh, the lesson of the intervening decades is that we've got to do better in all of these things. And that is a lesson which lawyers have a particular reason to learn because lawyers have generally been um, parties to the enforcement of the old laws that were discriminatory and prejudicial mm. and uh, that's why there's a special need for lawyers to be aware. I never asked any questions at law school on any of the above topics. I never put my hand up. No one put their hand up. We just accepted that was the law and we didn't question it. Well, we've got to be more questioning. For the second segment, we want to focus on your roles and achievements, which epitomises your brilliance as an esteemed Australian and international scholar, jurist and advocate. 
Firstly, domestically, you were appointed the inaugural chairperson of the ALRC, a federal court judge, and of course, a, a justice for the High Court of Australia. For present purposes, we'll focus on the latter. In a 2010 journal article, you stated that judges and lawyers must play leading parts in harmonizing international and municipal law. How did you incorporate this greater international obligation of common humanity in your approach during your tenure at the High Court of Australia? Well, uh, as a practitioner, I can see, I mean, you, you'd have to be blind not to see that um, we have to um, look at our national legal systems, the municipal law, in a new context. There is a new context, and that new context is the rapid growth of international law. Now, one of the things that is increasingly recognised and has been expressed very clearly by uh, the House of Lords and uh, the High Court of Australia and other courts on interpretation is context, context, context. Uh, in real estate, we say location, location, <laughs> location. But in, in, in law, we say context, context, context. And therefore, we have to find what is the context of our own nation's constitution. And that context is the increasing body of international law uh, in the context of which our constitution has to swim. And this is therefore not an unusual thing to do to have regard to the context today of international law. And essentially that's all that the Bangalore principle said and it's all that the decisions that I made in the Court of Appeal said uh, and it's what the High Court said in Marbo uh, and what um, I said in al Kateb and eventually it will be accepted. The puzzling thing is why there is such resistance to it in the Australian legal system and that teaches us that lawyers are often a little rigid in their thinking and they've got to be released from that rigidity. So in regards to challenging this rigid nature of law, how did your career prep you for your UN and international appointments and what advice would you give to those who want to follow your path? Well, I don't say you should follow my path because everybody's got their own path and their own interests and, and chance and luck play an enormous part in your career. I mean, when I was welcomed to the High Court, um, the Attorney General of the day said, your honour's appointment to this court was inevitable. And I thought, well, if it was inevitable, why did it take so long? <laughs> <laughs> but um, uh, nothing really is inevitable in life. Uh, you remember that wonderful um, film, Dead Poets Society, where um, uh, Robin Williams gets on the desk mm -hmm and uh, he points out carpe diem, you have to seize the day. And so that's what people have to do. They've got to be alert, they've got to be prepared, and they've got to seize the day of the opportunities that will come their way. And that's what I did. I was a Caesar of the day. <laughs> And I'm still seizing the day, uh, and I'll go on doing so until I'm knocked on the head and, and the, the end uh, comes. But um, uh, I, I do think being able to see new things, why did I not ask any questions about Aboriginal rights? Why did I, who had experience of discrimination, mm. not ask any questions about women's rights or about the white Australia policy? Um, I didn't ask questions about LGBT rights because that was something in those days you were expected to be very, very ashamed of yourself and very quiet about. But I, I, I should have been more questioning about other things. Um, but I wasn't, and and I was a top student, and uh, I I had excellent teachers, mm. but that was the convention of that time. And the curious question is, what are the things that students today are silent about, that in years to come 
they, like me, will be ashamed of and will say, how could I have been so timid and so uncomplaining and genuinely not seeing things? Um, I, there are such issues, I think, for example, and I've become a bit involved in this, um, animal welfare and the fact that we chop up and eat living animals, sentient beings that are slaughtered and uh, that know what's happening and uh, uh, that is something where I think there's a degree of moral blindness. Why do the teachers go on rabbiting on and on about uh, adult sexual conduct when they say very little about animal welfare, you know? It's, and there's not much in the Bible about animal welfare. And if you look at the Bible, it says animals, uh, birds of the air and um, creatures of the ground are put on earth for man's delight. Well, we, we grow in moral appreciation. And that's just one example. The way we deal with drugs, the way we deal with refugees, the way we deal with prisoners. Um, there are lots of issues where we are blind and we need to be less blind, and especially lawyers, because lawyers have got their grubby hands mm -hmm. on the levers of power in the community. And I think this ties in quite nicely with a thing you previously stated, which was that each generation comes with a new set of responsibilities. And um, whether that is, you know, climate change or how we deal with refugees or prisoners and, and, and drugs, of course, um, I, I definitely think that that's a very valid point and something that we should definitely be thinking about. Um, Discussing this, I think we'll have the final question in regards to your work in the international realm. During your time as the UN Chief Commissioner, what were your greatest learnings about the operations of international mechanisms and, and some things that quite surprised you during that process? Well, I, I had so many. I mean, m magic moments of yeah. my life when I was involved in so many very interesting things. You know, this everything's interrelated, and I think the fact that I learned in student politics to be such a good chair, I'm a very good chair, mainly because I'm respectful of others and let others have their glory. But uh, I think that helped me to be respected in international meetings, and that led to people saying, well, there's this man in Australia with the fruity voice. You remember him? Um, uh, Kirby's his name. Uh, I think he'd be good to chair this. And then the opportunities come and you must carpe diem. And seize the day. <laughs> and seize the day. Uh, and essentially that's what I did. Mm -hmm. Now, it was interesting when I was chairing the Commission of Inquiry on North Korea. That was in 2013 to 14. That was probably the most responsibility that I've had because that went up uh, from the Human Rights Council to the um, General Assembly and exceptionally for a human rights issue to the Security Council. And uh, that uh, really was an opportunity to shine the light on a very oppressive state that was committing crimes against humanity, which the international community after the Second World War said, we will not ignore that, we will respond. And as you know, with the R2P in 2000, the international community said, if the state concern doesn't act, the whole international community will act if the crime is such as to shock the conscience of humanity. That's a crime against humanity. Uh, and so, all of this uh, got me working with a small team. You hear criticism of the UN, and uh, it can be a maddening body because it's so huge, but uh, it really, there are wonderful people who are devoting their lives to the achievement of human rights. And our team, well, there, were, there were 15 of us, um, and we were independent of the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, but they dedicated a section of the ground floor of the Palais Wilson in Geneva for the uh, Commission of Inquiry on North Korea. It was the Salle des Dames, the Room of Women. 
uh, and we were in the Salle des Dames, uh, and it had been sort of subdivided for us, and here we all were working on the project, the, the commission of inquiry, the evidence, the testimony, filming and putting it on the internet, using new technology, and all of this um, was a new technique for dealing with crimes against humanity. And uh, it, it caused a sensation when it was produced at the Human Rights Council. And uh, I think it's still having a very good effect and it will ultimately render North Korea accountable for the crimes against humanity because they're all there, it's all recorded, and it affronts the human rationality to ignore it and ultimately it will cause accountability just as at Nuremberg it will cause accountability and that is what the progress of humankind is designed to do and that's what international human rights is designed to do doesn't always work doesn't always work efficiently but we are at Runnymede. We are beginning the process of rendering tyrants accountable. And that's what international law can do. And I've been proud to have had a, a small part in achieving that and planting that idea in the next generation so they can take it further. And in this final segment, we can focus on some of the future aspects. So since retiring from the judiciary, you have been keeping a busy and vibrant schedule with an array of in initiatives and appointments. International law has been a key arena in which you have been active. Um, and noting this, your, your insights on future prospects will be very fascinating. Having said that, you previously stated that the biggest change in the law in your lifetime has been the increase of international law in Australian domestic law. Therefore, what do you believe is the trajectory of international law within Australia? Well, I'd like to say that the trajectory in Australia has been fine and that we're all going in the right direction and we're all singing from the same hymnal, but we're not. Uh, and there is a strange resistance in the Australian legal profession and judiciary and in the United States. It isn't universal and it doesn't exist everywhere. Some semi-tyrannies uh, have it, but you expect that. But we're not a tyranny and we're a, a good uh, and democratic country and that makes our situation much more puzzling. In America, they've always got the Bill of Rights as a foundation for some fundamental human rights. We don't even have that. So we're in a rather peculiar situation in Australia and we need to change things. Now, as to international law, well, we are making progress on climate change by the influence of the Paris Accords and I think that is very hard now for countries to resist it and to ignore it and, and therefore um, soft law is having its impact and that's a good thing. But take um, nuclear weapons um, and uh, take the decision of the International Court of Justice in 1996 that said it was the obligation of the nuclear weapon states to uh, take uh, immediate steps to reduce the stockpiles. Those stockpiles of hundreds, even thousands of nuclear weapons uh, in the hands of very few number of states, but an increasing very few number of states uh, are extremely dangerous. The fact that we've survived for 70 years is a blink of an eye in the, in the history of humanity. Uh, and yet, when I try to get lawyers and legal conferences to talk about nuclear weapons and legal responses to nuclear weapons and what are we doing about implementing the advice of the uh, International Court of Justice, there's a big yawn. Now, why is that? answer, it's just too complicated and there are too many power plays and we can't force it on others. But we've got to at least think about it, talk about it and where we can do something about it. And the nuclear ban treaty, the, the treaty that came into force this year, 2021, uh, that 
is a, for, is a step in the direction of putting controls on uh, nuclear weapons and nuclear stockpiles. And I think uh, New Zealand has uh, signed and ratified it, uh, Austria has signed and ratified it, Ireland has signed and ratified it, uh, many countries, um, um, Thailand, uh, the Philippines and others, South Africa have signed and ratified it. We didn't even give a little reception Australian champagne, bubbly, Australian bubbly, I mustn't <laughs> say champagne. We didn't even give that to the people in ICANN, the International Committee Against Nuclear Weapons. Uh, we didn't give them a, a, a reception when they won the Nobel Prize for Peace in 2017 and they were Australians. It started in Melbourne, Australia. Melbourne's a very serious place and it started down there in Melbourne and Professor Tillman Ruff went to um, Oslo and got the, new, the, the Nobel Prize for Peace. And I've seen him at conferences, he hands the Nobel Prize around <laughs> and I tell him keep an eye because this is Australia. We were born in convicts and there may be somebody will pinch it. But I think Australia should be doing more on this issue. It's an existential issue. Uh, it's said we can't do anything because of our treaty with the United States and Pine Gap. But New Zealand has taken steps and so have other uh, NATO countries. And I think we've got to find ways that we can take a step that gives a lead on nuclear weapons. Otherwise, the whole thing will be over one day and, and we will have turned our back. So uh, am I happy with the state of nuclear, uh, the state of international law? No, I'm not happy with the state of international law. There is too much yet to be done, but at least we've started and we know what has to be done and Australian lawyers should be taking a more active part in all of these great challenges of humanity. It's in our self-interest and as a prosperous democratic country we should be giving a lead and we should be putting more Australians in the Salle des Dames at the Palais Wilson in Geneva taking a role in building the international law of human rights. And I think this is quite refreshing that you said, you know, in some instances, Australia can do better. And in regards to this, you have stated previously that there's a, a big importance of not being complacent with an imperfect legal system. And you've defined yourself as a stirrer of the issues of the day. Why, why do you think it's important for law students to stir things up and um, raise their voices in, in regards to this matter? I think that the key to it is to study hard if you're interested in international law and human rights. Not everybody is, and uh, but if you are, you've got to get a very good grounding in law and lawyering. And if you've got that, you can uh, use that uh, for the purpose of advancing uh, universal human rights. And we used to see it in the High Court when I was uh, in those glory days, uh, Justice of the High Court, in the migration cases and the refugee cases. They were ostensibly just administrative law cases, but they were effectively human rights cases in many cases, and they were cases where good lawyering and skilled and talented capacity to argue legal points made uh, a blow for universal human rights. And that's why I always tell people, actually people who are only interested in human rights, they can sometimes be a menace because they don't have the skills and the talents to advance the arguments in ways that will be winnable. And winning the argument is, is what's important and that extends to ensuring that our judges in Australia are picked from a larger pool that has tended to be the case at the moment. And people who are really good at big time commercial cases, not necessarily going to be the most open-minded about the role of universal human rights in the Australian legal system and how, in default of a constitutional bill of rights, 
they can introduce these notions into the legal system that we have. And as a concluding uh, remark, do you have anything that um, we can look forward to in regards to the upcoming UN article that, that you are, are hoping to write? What I did uh, in the spare moments in the Salle des Dames, because never leave a minute to be lost in this life, I reached out to the Australians who I knew were in the building and I invited them uh, to come down. They couldn't come into that space because that was a security area. We'd locked it off. And um, uh, But I saw them in the Palais Wilson. Uh, one of them was my last associate in the Court of Appeal before I was appointed to the High Court. Simon Walker's his name. Uh, he was an excellent associate, very good user of time. He knew how to prioritise all the things that were on my desk. He was excellent at that. And now he has become one of the top lawyers working in the, um, in the building for the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. Uh, he became an expert on um, TRIPS, the TRIPS agreement, which is the agreement for um, intellectual property law uh, and patent law in the context of the availability of medicines. This has become extremely important, of course, with the, with the COVID-19 uh, pandemic and the vaccines and uh, the call that Western countries should make sure that the international patent law does not interfere with uh, the rights of people to health, to basic health care, uh, which is not only in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, but is also in the um, uh, Sustainable Development Goals. Mm. So, um, you know, our, the Prime Ministers, the G7, are meeting and they're saying, oh, we've got to give vaccines and Australia has been tackled. Why have you been so neglectful on giving vaccines to poorer countries? Uh, and uh, uh, this is this is going to happen increasingly, and this is international law. And Simon Walker had worked upon how the international patent regime could uh, be adapted for the world of universal human rights. And uh, he's he's headed the office of the uh, High Commissioner for Human Rights in Phnom Penh in Cambodia, where I previously had worked. Uh, he's a top lawyer, a top international lawyer, and he's working in the um, in the office of the High Commissioner in Geneva, and I'm just going to tell the story of people like Simon Walker. He's one of many Australians. Australians get into it, and basically they get into it by going there as slaves and, and uh, offering to work virtually for nothing until they're noticed and then they jump on the desk and they say carpe diem. As someone who is a change maker, not only by the positions you've been appointed to, but also the vigour that you have when you, what you stand for, um, both in and out of the courtroom, you continue to be a radiant Australian and international legal icon. As a student and behalf of countless others who see you as an inspiration, we thank you for your generous time and will cherish the wisdom you imparted to us today. Thank you very much. Thank you.